So next up, we're a little close to home, so we've got um, uh, David Joffe. So David's uh, head of Net Zero at the Climate Change Committee, uh, as I'm sure you know, advise uh, government on climate change and working towards Net Zero. Um, he leads the committee's progress reporting on emissions reductions for, for different carbon budgets. He's, uh, and he was instrumental in the sixth carbon budget and is now head of overseeing the committee's analysis of the seventh carbon budget. So, uh, yes, David. So. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, good. Does this work? Yes, it does. Great. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, excellent talk, Andy. Thanks so much. Uh, and brilliant overview of uh, so many of the issues, and hopefully my uh, presentation will be complementary and bring out some of the issues. I'm going to talk mainly about the UK. Uh, the, the Climate Change Committee, of course, is uh, advisor to the UK government on, uh, on climate change, so, of course, uh, quite UK-focused in terms of our uh, our analytical work, but within a, a, a global context. Um, okay, so what do we do? We recommend targets. Uh, so these are targets of five-year periods, uh, five-year carbon budgets, which are limits on greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the UK. Um, they're set at least 12 years in advance uh, of, of those periods so that policy can actually then work uh, to, to re reduce emissions. Sixth carbon budget, which Sean mentioned, uh, covers the, the period, uh, the five years in the middle of the, the, the 2030. So that was uh, all, all the analysis really that I'm going to show today was done in 2020 uh, as an input to the advice on the sixth carbon budget, which was legislated at, at the, the level we recommended in 2021 by the government. Uh, it's actually very stretching. I'm not sure the government realised how stretching it was at the time, and that may have affected some of the recent rollbacks that we've, that we've seen, and we can talk about that later on. But it's, it's a pretty ambitious path. It needs to be ambitious because net zero is actually pretty difficult. And I, again, I'm not sure that's fully understood uh, by politicians. But also, the area under the curve is what affects the climate. It's not the end point. It's the area under the curve. And that's why it's important to have something that, that, that tries to be uh, as deep as possible over the next 10, 15 years, rather than just as long as we get to zero in 2050, it doesn't matter. So that's a, a crucial part. So we do that. We also m then monitor uh, the UK's progress towards meeting the targets. And we were fairly critical in our June annual progress report uh, on progress to date. And obviously, things have moved since then as well. OK, um, so I'm going to talk about some of the choices on the path to net zero. Now, actually, so the, the range of choices is not actually that big because we need to get pretty much all sectors to zero emissions by 2050. And there's only so many ways of doing that. But there are some degrees of freedom, so I'll bring some of those out. Um, you can see the list. I'm not going to read all of them, but I'll, I'll step through with a, with a few charts uh, talking about that. But you may be surprised in some of the charts how similar the different scenarios look rather than uh, the differences. Um, and that, as I say, is, is part of... Uh, part of what this looks like. Of course, one, one of the things that I don't acknowledge in my charts and in the rest of the, the talk is the possibility that we might not get to net zero by 2050. The CCC doesn't allow any acknowledgement whatsoever that we might fail in this endeavour, even though it's really hard. Of course, you may have your own views about, are we definitely going to get there? So um, the, the quicker uh, and the better we can take this action, uh, is the better it's going to be for the climate and also then, of course, the co-benefits of action, of which air quality is uh, a, a very big one, and, and Andy uh, set out some of the other ones on, on exercise and so on. So I'm going to go through some diagrams and, and charts. So in 2020, we did five pathways to net zero. Four, you can see around the edge, uh, kind of exploratory, setting out the solution space, if you like, for what could net zero look like in a UK context? Where are the different uh, uncertainties? Where are the different choices? Um, some of the uncertainties were felt to be around how much behavioral and societal change can we expect from people? You know, can we expect them to change their diets by 10 or 20% in terms of reduction in red meat consumption? Well, probably yes. But can we expect 40 or 50% reduction? We've modeled it. We've got a scenario with it in, but we don't know. So that's kind of a stretch uh, scenario in that direction. So that's kind of the range of 20 to 50% uh, uh, diet change in terms of 
uh, reduce red meat consumption and so on. And on the other axis, we've got innovation and you know, how quickly do new, better technologies come along uh, and how quickly do the, do the costs fall and so, and so on. From that, we produced four uh, exploratory scenarios and then the one that's going to feature in most of the charts is the balanced net zero pathway where we try to navigate our way through that solution space and set out a recommended uh, path there. It is consistent with the UK's international commitments um, and the UK needs to be seen as a leader in this space, both because all developed countries need to lead, but also because quite a lot of them are not, and therefore it's all the more important that the UK does. Okay, so on to some slides. So I've set out the, the, the five scenarios. Here they are in terms of residual emissions in 2050. Now, the most important point here is the, the white diamonds in the middle, which show the net emissions uh, in each of the scenarios in 2050. Those have to be no higher than zero because we need to meet uh, net, net zero uh, by 2050 at the latest. You can see tailwinds, which is kind of the most optimistic on both behavior change and innovation, goes net negative, significant, significantly net negative. Um, by 2050, it actually gets to net zero in the early 2040s. Um, but that's huge, the optimistic both in terms of innovation and societal and behavioral change and frankly policy delivery and all of those other things that we don't necessarily uh, model that well. Um, so the things below the axis, which is sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, broadly speaking, whether you do that through natural means such as the well-established technology known as a tree, uh, or whether it's uh, through more engineered uh, things using carbon capture and storage, where we sequester the CO2 geologically under the ground, some combination of those. Um, the sectors where we don't think we can get to absolute zero emissions uh, by 2050, or you know, you'd have to believe a lot of things in order to do so, are aviation, agriculture, and then there's a few bits of other sectors. But you can see on the right here, there's a bunch of sectors that we think we can get pretty close to zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, including transport, which is the highest emitting uh, sector in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and obviously really important for uh, health outcomes in a range of ways as well. So those all look pretty similar, actually, but you see the different balances between what's going on um, and, yeah, that... that that, that shows the different picture there. Okay, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide just to talk you through, well, what's actually in our balanced pathway, which is the main one that we talk about and what, what underpins uh, the, 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 the target recommendation, which then became legislated. So t I'll talk through uh, from top to bottom. Uh, first of all, explaining the slide. So you can see historical emissions on the left here. Oh, I've got a pointer. There we go. Uh, historical emissions here, then this, the top here of the wedges, that's what would happen to emissions if we had no climate policy from kind of now on. And you can see that that's gradually rising as the gains we made are, you know, are, are still there, but we make no further progress. And of course, the population grows and, and those sorts of things, uh, gently increasing emissions. And this is the path for emissions that we need to get to, uh, which is pretty steep. Um, and of course, within that, then there are all the uh, all of the wedges between those are the contributions that are made by different actions uh, to reduce emissions. Now, at the top and deliberately at the top, we've got the de demand side changes. That's in two categories. One is sort of changes in behaviour, doing less of the harmful things. So that might be flying less. It's not banning flying. Some people would maybe say we should do that, but it's certainly flying less than business as usual. It's eating less red meat, for example, and those sorts of things. But then, uh, importantly as well, a wedge of doing things more efficiently. So, you know, household energy efficiency, for example, getting the same outcomes in terms of comfort, but using less energy to do so. So those are really important. Now, those are really important for a number of reasons. One is you can do them pretty quickly, and that helps with the cumulative emissions of, of greenhouse gases, and it helps with the other things that we've been talking about that Andy talked about in terms of you know, getting the quick impacts on human health in terms of air quality and, uh, and other things. Um, but a lot of the co-benefits that come from climate action 
come from these demand side things. So as, as Andy mentioned, the active travel, the walking and cycling, the changes in diet that are, you know, changes to healthier diets, um, as well as, uh, of course, improved uh, air quality, which unlike the other ones I mentioned, is a general benefit to society rather than a benefit to the individual. And it's important to distinguish between those. Some of these things will reduce the emissions that I cause and improve essentially only my health. Other things will improve everybody else's health if I'm driving less, for example. I don't drive very much. It's, it's not me you, you need to worry about. Um, OK, so, so that is a relatively small proportion in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but really, really important in terms of the wider benefits to society. And it's really important not to consider climate action in a silo and isolated from all of the other things that are going on in society and all of the other challenges uh, that we have, both environmental and, and uh, in terms of health and so on. OK, then the biggest wedge, the orange one, oh, no, wrong button, there we are, the orange one, um, that's electrification. Now, that's the biggest one, and we think the absolute backbone, really, of, of net zero in terms of the energy system, then, is stop burning fossil fuels, start using clean electricity in a highly efficient way to replace those fossil fuels. Now, that's across a few sectors. So in transport, it is switching from fossil fuel vehicles to electric vehicles. Now, of course, the fewer vehicles we have, the better. Uh, both because there are non-exhaust emissions from ele electric vehicles, the tyre wear and so on, that affect uh, air quality, also because of the benefits of walking and cycling. But nevertheless, if you're going to have cars, have electric cars. Um, it's better for the climate. It's better for air quality. So we, we should absolutely do that. It's also better for the economy. It's cheaper. It's going to be cheaper. It's going to save us quite a lot of money as a country. Uh, and that's important. And, and <coughs> Andy mentioned positive tipping points, and I think we've, we've got to a point now with, with battery technology and, and electric vehicles where, you know, even if people didn't care about the environmental and the climate change benefits of these technologies, they're just better and they're going to be cheaper to run and so on. So why wouldn't people embrace them in the same way that people have embraced smartphones, not because anyone told them to do it, but because, you know, it, it's there. Of course, you, you would choose that option. Now... Some of the other things on electrification are not in that bracket. So heat pumps, heat pumps, really important technology, really good technology, but they're more expensive than a gas boiler or a fossil fuel boiler. Um, and they're not that much cheaper to run. So overall, we think this is a net cost. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. We think this is part of, overall, a cost-effective package of tackling climate change, but it's quite a different dynamic to what we have on electric vehicles. But again, if you can switch to heat pumps powered by uh, mainly renewable electricity, and I'll come on and talk about electricity supplies, then again, you know, you're taking a whole lot of combustion out of the energy system, um, and that's, that's better for, for air quality as well as uh, the climate. Moving through then, we've got a, a small chunk here of hydrogen now that's mainly burning hydrogen to replace fossil gas. Some people think hydrogen is the answer for everything. I don't. I did my PhD on hydrogen. It's a different bit of Imperial College. But I don't think it's the answer for everything. I think it's the answer for where you can't do the electrification. So where we can do the orange thing, we should do the orange thing. Where we can't, yes, hydrogen is a good solution, but not for everything. We need to focus it. We need to target it. And its air quality outcomes will not be as good as uh, some of the uh, electrification because if you burn hydrogen you still get NOx and, and so on from that. And then there's a range of other things. We've got a little bit of industrial carbon capture. Um, of course we need to decarbonize our existing energy supplies, uh, the existing uh, electricity system which uh, we actually decarbonized by about 70% last decade um, which a lot of people didn't even notice. Um, we pushed coal almost completely off the electricity system. We hugely expanded renewables and so on. That's uh, arguably the one real success story of, of, of UK uh, climate policy to date. And then, of course, at the bottom, we've got the bits that balance out the remaining emissions once you get to, uh, to, to, get to net zero. OK, uh, I'm going to go off this slide, but it will make a comeback later on in a slightly different guise. 
All right, so I mentioned electrification is really important. That means we need more electricity. How much more electricity? At least double. So this, this is our balanced pathway, and it's about a doubling of electricity. But that's conservative, and I say that on the, on the right-hand side here. This is using electricity really efficiently in electric vehicles, which are up to around three times as efficient as a petrol or diesel car, using it in heat pumps, which, again, are at least three times as efficient as a, a fossil fuel boiler. But there are inefficient ways of using uh, zero carbon electricity uh, as well. And once you start turning to those, the, 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 the curve can start ramping up pretty quickly. And, and so I've seen scenarios with three or even fourfold increases in electricity consumption uh, by 2050. Whether it's plausible that we can actually build that much is an important question. But nevertheless, this is a huge hugely important part of the story and really importantly as well the supply of this is going to be heavily renewables dominated wind and solar are now really cheap so you want to have a system that's dominated by wind and solar uh, and nuclear to the extent that we've still got it and we may even actually finish building a plant at some point um, uh, as well and then that's just backed up by some other solutions um, but you know that the backup will be sort of 15% of the system, that sort of thing. It's, it's dominated by the zero carbon sources. Okay, so this is an illustration of uh, the value of zero carbon electricity in different, uh, different uses and, and emphasizing why we should use uh, the, the, the wind and the solar as efficiently as possible in you, uh, driving heat pumps, uh, powering electric vehicles, and of course pushing fossil generation off the system. You just get a lot more bang for your, for your buck in, in carbon terms uh, by pushing those things off because they're so efficient. You can push more fossil fuels out of the system, essentially. So that's really important, and that's where our scenarios focus. But that means we don't get to do as much of the inefficient stuff like green hydrogen production, which has to be way down the queue in terms of uh, the, the, the things that you do. And I'll come on to the consequences of that, both in terms of how much hydrogen we might use and where we might get it from. OK, so this is a new version of, of the chart that I showed before. Unhelpfully, I've both changed the order and changed some of the colors. And I didn't notice till just before I was giving the presentation. Uh, two, there are two different versions of, of this chart. So what's happened is the, the bit that's in yellow here used to be further down. So that's decarbonizing existing energy supplies. I put it further up because it logically, let's reduce demand. Let's decarbonize what we've got at the moment. OK, and then let's expand use of zero carbon uh, el electricity to, to other sectors. Logically, that makes more sense. However, it is confusing when you compare it to the other one. So apologies for that. The other thing that, uh, that I've done in this chart, or rather my, my former colleague, Tom Andrew, who some of you may know moved to, to the NHS to work on, on climate change, um, we've identified the bits that use carbon capture and storage here, which again, we've tried to minimize the use of it um, to the extent we can, but it's still, it's an important solution in, in some of these areas. So some of it is uh, here, that's gas power generation with carbon capture. That's a, a small fraction of, of decarbonization, as, as I mentioned, but it's important to back up the system that's renewables dominated at times when the wind's blowing less and those sorts of things. Uh, down here, we've got what's known as blue hydrogen. That's producing hydrogen from fossil fuels with carbon capture. Why have we got that? Because we can't have enough green, because we, the, the, we need all the electrons for the things on the left-hand side. We haven't got enough to produce loads of green hydrogen as well. So if we're going to use hydrogen, it needs to come from other sources, and this is uh, the best alternative that we've managed to identify. It's not great. And the economics of it don't look great because gas prices are really high at the moment. We'd like not to, be, not to have to use it. But the reason why it's in there is if we took it out, we'd have slower greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Um, so overall, we think better to have it in, even though it's not the perfect solution, than uh, to emit it and just burn more unabated fossil fuels. So that was the judgment. We can argue about whether that's the right thing. Uh, and so on. The other thing is, if you could produce more green hydrogen, if you could produce uh, just, you know, let, let's generate even more wind, even more solar, maybe we can push out some of these fossil fuels with, with carbon capture. 
Okay, I'll get off this chart. All right, so this is another one, fossil fuel with, with carbon capture, and you see essentially on the left-hand side what we've got here, uh, must remember to use the pointer, um, is the unabated use of fossil gas without carbon capture and storage. Um, that's what we do today, and we're transitioning to over here, <coughs> dominated by, by the carbon capture, and I think this is the version of the graph with the yellow uh, with the, uh, the, the, the green wedge not labelled, so apologies for that. But it is, of course, use with CCS in uh, something in hydrogen production, I believe. Right, sorry about that. Um, so we're moving to almost completely uh, all, all gas used in 2050 used with carbon capture, essentially. But there are choices over the sort of red, yellow, and green thing here. We could do much less of this and much more renewable energy if we can build enough. And that's a choice that we need to make. Some of this is artificially constrained by modeling assumptions. And of course, there will be modelers in the room who will know that your model only tells you really what you told it in terms of what's possible in the, in the real world. OK, going back to what I said earlier, a lot of these pathways look quite similar. So this, these are, again, the five pathways I set out earlier that will get to net zero in or before 2050. This is the uh, evolution of oil demand across the pathways. And you can see they're all clustered together. They all look pretty much the same. Why do they all look pretty much the same? Because we've made an assumption that you don't phase out, you, you don't scrap cars early. You let them get to the end of their natural life, and only then do you replace them with an electric car. And so. The shape of the curve is determined by how quickly are those, you know, how quickly, A, can we get to somewhere around here where every new car is an electric car, and then how quickly are the fossil cars coming off out, out of the fleet and being replaced by electric cars. Now, if we look at premature scrappage or early scrappage of assets, not necessarily, it might not be that it makes sense for vehicles, it might make much more sense for gas boilers. Um, but we're going to look in our, in our next carbon budget analysis about actually just because you've installed a gas boiler last year, do you need to carry on running for another 14 years before you can move to something clean? Or maybe is there a, a, a way of moving a bit quicker there? Um, does it really make sense to carry on burning gas for 14 years just because you, know, you couldn't quite get the heat pump supply chains uh, to, to a point where they, they could... Uh, deliver what you needed when you needed it. So we're, we're going to be looking at, at that, and that will change the shape of these curves if scrappage becomes an important consideration there. Of course, scrappage does come with some downsides, so there's extra cost, right? If you install the boiler last year and then you scrap it next year, there's a cost of that that, that, that does increase costs. There will be extra emissions because you've, you know, you've built something that you're then not using for very long and replacing it with something else that you had to build as well. Um, but it could be uh, an important part of climate policy, um, and particularly as well if we have very volatile fossil fuel prices, people might want to get rid of their gas boiler because gas gets so expensive, and that's what we had over the last couple of years, but we didn't have supply chains for heat pumps to come in and for, for people to say, I don't want my boiler anymore, let's have a heat pump. So that w that, that's been challenging. As we develop those supply chains, then these sorts of solutions will become more viable. OK, that is my quick tour through net zero pathways. And uh, questions, please. 